This video is not intended for persons under the age of 13. Thank you for clicking on this video. I hope you enjoy. And if you do, then don't forget to like and subscribe. Ring that notification bell so you stay up to date on further content. Zhu Lan Chu, and welcome aboard the USS Shadow Star. Welcome to Shadow Star. I am Captain Richard, aka the Renegade, and this is Star Trek Online, a Starship review video, specifically stats. So if you're here to take a look at the visuals of this ship, I'm afraid you're in the wrong place. Check out the description below to find your trans warp. Oh. Trans warp transporter technology warping to, I don't know, the correct time period for the visual review. The link is below. However, if you're here to see what the stats of this impressive scout ship can do, well, say no more. That is what we'll be looking into. So, first of all, allow me to welcome you. Members of the Federation, the Klingon Empire, Romulan Republic, and, of course, the Dominion. Welcome, and please get comfortable as we enter the Vulcan system to take a look at a masterpiece of a starship. Now, those who know me know that I have a distinct problem with the JJ-verse the Kelvin Timeline. I can give you many reasons why the Kelvin Timeline would never actually exist. Temple paradoxes aside and temple investigations doing their job. Well, what can we say? They didn't do their job if Vulcan doesn't exist. Bah, that's neither here nor there. I've lightened up to the Kelvin timeline, I will admit. There are parts of the Kelvin timeline I like. The Ventures class is one. This ship is another. So, allow me to introduce to you the beautiful, the jellyfish. Oh, look at her. Tell me she's not beautiful. You know what? There's a lot of things the JJ Verse got wrong. Well, that ship has a warp ring, which is Vulcan in design. It is a Vulcan ship. It has a very interesting design with almost all parameters of the ship moving minus its primary core. And although the whole aesthetic is gone towards the whiter end of things, She's got an interesting hull plate to her that gives her definitely what I would say a fitting touch between Federation and Vulcan design aesthetics. It's essentially a much lighter armor version of Vulcan hull armor. So I like it. She's a scout ship, guys. A tier 6 scout ship. And... Those that caught my stream know that I'm expecting this ship to be very science orientated. If it was any other, I would be highly disappointed. Yes, I'm smiling. <laughs> so, this tier 6 ship is available to any faction and as long as you've completed the tutorial, you can open the box and start flying this ship. Her whole modifier is a highly modest 0 0.8 The kind of thing you'd expect from a tactical ship scout ship or a raider Now I was definitely thinking this ship would fit heavily into raiders because I don't really know many scout ships in my head or off the top of my head at least But Away from that she shows the signs of science Her shield modifier is 1.35 very, very powerful. Lord, that is definitely going to give her an advantage in the long run. She can definitely take punishment, and even more so, as we're going to see later, 
Her shield's her greatest asset. She has four forward weapons, two aft, and no experimental weapon slot, so she's not a raider or an escort. Though she does seem to have the armor of an escort and the weapon layout of a pilot ship. The Vulcan Experimental Scout Vessel is actually a pilot ship in classification. So, that is, well, very pilot ship like in classification, should I say. So, that's not too far from what I'd expect. She has two device slots, similar to an escort. The pilot maneuvers, so. As you can see, she does have the pilot configura configuration of abilities, so she can uh, basically advance dodge the enemy. <laughs> I've just realized, don't know how many people have spotted the name of my ship yet, but I've just realized it probably would have fit better if I had just said Nimoy. Oh, <laughs> uh, it was too fitting I had to name it that. She has a base turn rate of 20. This actually causes her to equal the original pilot ships introduced into the game. If you can guys can remember them, such as the Mercury and the Icarus. Icarus? Icarus. Uh, well, those were the Federation's ones. The pilot ships have always been a very high maneuverability, powerful, quick strike ship. Good for hit and run. Ironic then to say that this ship, though it's very similar, could sit in a fight longer than those pilot ships. Despite having the same maneuverability, she already takes better punch thanks to her shields. Her impulse modifier is a very impressive 0.23. This means she actually also, I believe she outperforms on average the pilot vessels. Well, she might be a little bit slower than the original pilots, but she's definitely faster than the Alliance pilots. Her inertia rating is 80, meaning it's very good for her to keep enemies in... Well, very easy for her, should I say, to keep enemies in the forward attack arc. Definitely going to be landing a few dangerous shots. And then we get to the bit where I'm a little bit... Mm, not sure I wanted to see that. But, I guess it's kind of fitting. Her bonus power settings is a plus 10 to weapons, plus 5 to shields, and plus 5 to auxiliary. auxiliary. Wow, my stutter is really bad today. I do apologise. Personally, I would have preferred to have her... It is bad today. I would have preferred her to have... Plus 10 on the shields and say 5 weapons or 5 engines. Or plus 10 engines, 5 shields, 5 auxil auxiliary. But plus 10 weapons, plus 5 shields, plus 5 auxiliary does make her still a very dangerous ship. And in fact, overall, oh, I get to say this twice. She makes a very good build for the type of player I am, a support DPS. Hey, any ship with auxiliary boosting is a good DPS build. Sorry, a good auxiliary, good support build. DPS-wise, she's going to be pretty good thanks to her plus 10 weapons power settings, and she's got a good weapon arrangement, plus she's very fast. Of course, she's not a DPS titan, she's not going to be one of the ultimate DPS ships, but she's going to be pretty damn good. We can definitely guarantee so far she can shield tank because, well, she, her hull might be weak, but her shields are definitely not. So she's a bit of a shield tanky ship as well, and then to top things off, she's going to do support quite well as she has auxiliary boosting, she has good shield power, and, well, we're going to get really into where she shows her support abilities in just a second. Consoles, guys. Consoles are very interesting to ships. They can often make or break. Well, this ship is 5 tactical. No, it's not. Remind me to get, like, a, a support person along to slap me. She's 5 science, 
free tactical, free engineering. I have to remember that when I try to say the largest one, look at the largest one, not just the first one on the screen. So with five science console positions, we already know that this ship is going to be quite the powerful punch in exotic damage and in the form of support. Plus, she can perform good tanking with her shields thanks to five science console positions as she can do a lot of shield boosting and shield hardness boosting. Basically, she's quite dangerous. Free engineering positions means that she can actually improve her hull and she has got enough there because I require free engineering console positions at minimum with my standard build type. And she's got just enough there to make a nice strong ship. Admittedly, I have to sacrifice one of my normal engineering consoles to put in a different one, but that's just because I'm going to need to improve the hull a little bit. With free tactical, she can deal a decent amount of damage. It's not over the top, so yes, DPS players, you won't be finding this ship to be as great as other starships that you could possibly fly. I know DPSs like to have the minimum of four tactical consoles, but like I said already, this ship can deal out exotic damage. And so if you're smart and know what sort of weapons deal exotic damage as well, these are, I, this is my meaning, I'm talking about weapons such as, oh, let's go for the first one I can think of. Could arm this ship with, say, yoink, where are you going, Terran Task Force? Armor out with the Withering Disruptors. Oh, thanks for that. Uh, totally what I meant, wanted that to do. And you see, Withering Disruptors deal radiation damage. Now, that radiation proc, despite coming from primary weapons, radiation damage always counts under exotic damage. So, thanks to your science console boosting, you can boost exotic damage output. And, in essence, you'll boost the damage output of the Withering Disruptors. Then you just have a minor bit of disruptor boosting. There are universal consoles that also boost disruptor damage, so you could use those as well to assist you. And you'll find the ship is dealing quite a heavy amount of damage, regardless of having only three tactical positions. Thankfully, its science capability really does keep it in the DPS run. Although you have to know, of course, what you're doing. Safe to say then we've got, so far, Good DPS capability. Excellent shield tanking capability. And excellent support capability. She's doing quite well in the standing so far, isn't she? Now, let's see if the bridge officer positions can improve on this. Oh yes, they do. Like hell do they they are bird of prey esque so we have our commander science pilot position this is excellent this means this ship is dodging all levels of danger as well as holding in nice and tight to be able to see well if it can heal an ally heal itself drain that p rather annoying enemy, ensnare and trap the enemy so that its friends can just swarm and destroy. Swarm and destroy. Straight away, this ship has got good support capability in the bridge officer positions, as well as self-sustainability. Hell, the pilot's gonna mean it's avoiding most of the damage. But then it has two, count that two, Lieutenant Commander Universal positions. I don't know about you guys, but to build a good DPS ship, two Lieutenant Commanders do it for me. That's enough for me to build enough DPS capability up with my standard support DPS builds to have a good amount of damage. So already straight away, I can tick that I can get enough support capability in there and enough DPS capability in there 
to do my typical support DPS role. And this is not even going into the fact that you could use both those positions in a heavy science role and go for full control drain, full control drain support, would mean you're dealing absolutely zero damage really because you're gonna have to hold back, but you'll be able to keep all your allies in the fight, help your allies destroy the enemies, and then you can take up a secondary role such as drain or confuse to again assist your allies. Or you could go engineering. There is nothing stopping you from taking the engineering approach and building up the ship's toughness as well as using engineering capabilities to improve damage output or support output. Hell, some of the best techniques you can use is emergency power to shields. This is a shield tank, that's gonna come in handy. Then you get the next bridge officer position and this one I like as well because it really does scream now that this ship can survive a fight. Lieutenant Universal Miracle Worker. With that being said, you've now got a ship that can avoid damage and recover very quickly from damage. Pilot Miracle Worker is probably one of the more dangerous combinations I could imagine out there for anyone who wants to have a ship that basically, though it can't take a lot of damage, it can quickly recover from any damage taken, so it requires extremely heavy hits on it to actually take it out. In essence, there's no point in punching this ship with photon torpedoes, you're better off hitting it with one tricobalt device and trying to blow it up in one single hit. Because if you just keep hitting it with, mo with photon torpedoes to slowly punch it down, it's going to be recovering from the damage you're dealing to it. makes it quite dangerous. The final position is an Ensign Universal. So it's just that one extra science, tactical, engineering, whichever one you feel like you need to throw in there, it's just that one extra to go in there. Personally, that would probably be a science for me as I will use it as a way of dealing a bit of extra electrical damage through the correct bridge officer ability. The ship also has sensory analysis, which is a science capability. The secondary deflector slot, which means this ship then has the improved support capabilities of the secondary deflector. Everyone that really goes for support roles knows the secondary deflector is critical in making your support abilities at their absolute finest. That, as well as people who go for drain or control, will also tend to prefer to have a ship with a secondary deflector on. So it's good to see it's on this ship. Its console and its Starship Mastery Package are very interesting as well, and the ship also comes with something that we originally got from the Crystalline Entity event. I'm sure you guys are aware of it, the Red Matter Capacitor. Some of you may already have this capacitor, but if you don't, I guess the ship is a modest way of getting it. The Starship Mastery Package is the Scout Package, allowing for precise weapon systems, plus 5 to accuracy, then, enhanced particle generators, what was I saying about exotic damage just now, plus 15% damage to exotic damage abilities. Then, enhanced weapon banks, plus 15% critical severity, great for you who would like to prefer the crit strikes. Enhanced restorative circuitry, <laughs> circuitry improves hull and shield hull ability, healing abilities by 10%, so this basically means you're now able to improve the how much you repair your shields and your hull. That emergency power to shields definitely just came in handy, didn't it? And its trait, slippery target. Again, the survivor's trait. Oh boy. We are going there. Now, I've zoomed out a little bit. I didn't really mean to be doing that, but hey -o. Let's go back and take a tight look on this ship. So, her Admiralty stats, as I'm sure some of you are wondering, is Engineering 28, Science 62, and Tactical 36. Special bonus is times 2.5 bonus for Science. And well, let's just say,
This is going to be one impressive ship. There is one final thing I need to bring up though. A new weapon, a very new weapon, that proceeds to be quite dangerous actually. Personally, I would prefer the rapid firing quantum launcher, but... Let's discuss this bad boy. The Quad Micro Photon Torpedo Launcher. A 90 degree arc, standard for torpedoes, dealing 4,624.5 kinetic damage, applies overwhelming force, high yield to target, this is a dangerous little launcher, and I'm sure some of you are questioning What will its stats be when it is upgraded? Can you upgrade it? Well... Good, I have one on me. Let's make use of it. Turns out you can upgrade it. Quad launcher, nicely in there, yes. So we can see where it's sitting right now. One heavy upgrade, and the upgrade you get from it, let's see. So we're looking at where it is right now, 5202, oh sorry. Well, that doesn't seem right, does it? Looks like it's not modified at all. I'm going to waste a couple of Phoenix on this just to see if it changes up a little bit. Good. So, yeah. Oh, will I get lucky? Stop it. Give me the epic already. Oh, there we go. Put the epic back in there, and now we're looking at eight thousand. Okay, eight thousand five hundred and seventy-six point two kinetic damage. The DPS being two thousand one hundred and forty-four. Damage times three. Reload. So reduces firing time by two seconds. And I've got the accuracy boost. Could always just uh, change accuracy to, well. Now I've got the ac and dam there, so that's not too bad. It's got a really good amount of damage there. That's actually quite good for a photon torpedo. We already know photon torpedoes fire quickly. So uh, this is good to see. One issue I've got with it though, because it's Prime Universe, Shouldn't be using Kelvin phasers, but we'll, we'll drop away from that, shall we? For those that don't know about the red matter capacitor, it just improves all your power levels for 20 seconds by 25 points. Essentially, well, you see where I am now. It's quite the dangerous boost, because you know how effective just one of those at 75 would be. Yeah, I like it. Not sure if this is a ship I'd ever really want to reduce engine power on, but hey, it's good. We can give it that. Secondary side notes, we can take a look now at the console. Now, the console was something I was intrigued in, but now I'm absolutely in love with it. So, eject red matter. Plus 17.1, all direct energy weapon damage. So no matter what energy weapon choice you like to use, this one will improve it by 17.1%. It's not bad. Plus 17.1 to Starship Exotic Particle Generators improves exotic damage. 
What did I say about those disruptors right now? Those withering disruptors. Looks like this is definitely a console to use in combination with that sort of weapon. I can think of a few others. Fluidic antiprotons could be another good example to use. But then you've got this ship's very scary, sorry, this console's very scary ability, it's active ability. So, eject red matter, an AoE, poor and kinetic damage. Essentially, we're going to be creating a combination gravity well and tricobalt rift. For those that don't know what I'm talking about, when a tricobalt device explodes, or a heavy tricobalt device explodes, you get, for a temporary period, a small well, similar to a gravity well, that deals heavy amounts of kinetic damage. This weapon, essentially, is going to be doing a combination of two. You fire one red matter at the target location, and what it's going to do is, essentially, yank the foe towards it within... Well, yanking foes within 7.5 kilometers towards the center point, close to the center point they get, dealing 659.2 kinetic damage, ignoring shields. So this is dangerous in the fact that even if the enemy shields are up, this red matter is going to be dealing heavy damage to them. And... I have just realised it says fires on stable red matter at target's location for 14 seconds. So is that firing more than one? Can't be. It's got to be only firing one or it could start to be a bit OP. But then again, that can end damage. No, if it was even, if even if it was only firing two per second, you're talking about seven of those. That would be... a. Uh, I'm literally wondering now what the likelihood of that is. Seven times... Nine... Would well, it only be four thousand... Might... Maybe... Be, be interested to see when we go to test it in just a second. Slippery target, the trait of this ship. Well, when you activate your pilot bridge officer abilities or auxiliary to dampeners... Okay, plus 300 all damage resistance versus foes within 3 kilometers. In other words, any foe dumb enough to get close to you is now no longer dealing that bonus damage. It's great because it then also placates those foes who critical hit you. In other words, foes are going to be wanting to do less critical hits against you, plus the advantage of getting in close because of the extra damage you get from being closer to the target is nullified. It would be interesting to see two of these ships fighting each other. Now, if you don't mind, I do believe it's time for the USS Nimoy to, uh, Whoopsie daisy, what are you doing? Take flight. USS Nimoy VS-270215. Get ready to see him in battle. Engage. Prepare for combat. We're gonna do this. And look how the hole is so shiny, it shows off the colour of the area you're in. Turn and have some fun. Now the biggest thing some of you will notice is the fact that my normal healing procs are not there. Yeah, I've got the discharge repair nanites, but I don't have the Kabali regen regenerative integrity field or the protomatter field. This is because I'm a little bit too confident about this shields this ship's shield ability. We're not going to show off the short ability straight away, but let's go see what we can do. First of all, Ship is under we're going to fire that weapon off. Oh, hey. That is actually somewhat effective, but 
Expecting. Not bad. Okay. Now to augment this ship into my combat style. I'm actually keeping the shields up because that's going to be my main survivability. Actually, I'm not going to. Let's rebalance. Go for weapon strike. And now I'm going to pull up auxiliary. So weapons high, shields auxiliary in balance. This is going to be fun! Jemadar Heavy Escort. Well, this should be really good. One, two, three. Put him out of Combination attacks are definitely going to be the ship's fault, eh? Gonna waste the boost and boosting quick. Actually, I'm going to sit here for a second, just wait it out, get ready to go for a really high damage output. Okay, here we come, so I'm gonna jump. I 
know if my hull's really been all that affected yet. Doesn't feel like it has. Which is scary to think, because normally my hull is to, like starting to drop and my shields are out and... Hmm... And I did find this ship very easy to make a build on. Hello, Jemadar Attack Ships. Would you like to play with me? Come on. We all want to have a little bit of fun here. Is it bullying if I go attack them at full power? Engines down. Shields down. Oh wait, I, I need to lock that down. There we go. Auxiliary and weapons at maximum power. I'm pretty sure this is considered bullying. I also could be quite vulnerable in a second. Science team doing their little repairs. Let's go. I would fight your Keldon, but I can't resist. Can't risk completing this section. Okay. Final thoughts, then, guys. Final thoughts as we reduce speed and cruise. Well, first of all, guys, I would love to hear your thoughts on this ship. So please make sure you say something. What you think of this ship in general in the comment section. But. Final thoughts. Okay, so let's let's give the ship its scores. As a tank, of course, hull tank, it's a bit... Mm, shield tank, it's a very strong, in fact, dangerously strong. So I've got to give it... If it could tank in all areas, it would score higher. But I've got to give it at least 8 out of 10, because it does shield tanking so well. If it could hold tank, it'd be a 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10. As a support vessel, well, there's no two ways around it. The ship just screams great support vessel. So I've got to give it a 10 out of 10. She's a diamond for that. DPS ship, as long as you know what you're doing, she's quite good. Yeah, she has her holdbacks. Not, not quite the effective number of consoles you might want for a, t for a DPS build, but she's got enough. And science is more than ready to augment her out and make her even stronger. I think it is safe to say... I'm just going to quickly double check something. If she can do something that I've not seen not seen in comment in any comment section on her, I'm going to increase her score. That's why I'm just quickly warping here. There is one thing that can increase her score from where it is by one mark. Can she load cannons? More likely, can she load dual cannons? Because, yes, yeah, she can load turrets and cannons. Almost any ship can. And as a cannon ship, she's fucking frightening. If you go for a side mount cannon build or a broadside build in this ship, you're going to find her DPS is literally off the charts for that kind of build. She's scary powerful. I mean, not off the charts, but you know what I mean. She's going to be quite effective. But, oh. Mm, 
8 out of 10. She gets 8 out of 10 DPS. Because she can load dual cannons. And with her high maneuverability, that's dangerous. That is very dangerous. So, right there, gotta give it to her. She gets 8 out of 10 for me. 8.5 8 out of 10 DPS wise. So, overall score for a scout ship, for what should be science orientated, and she really is, I think I will score her 9 out of 10. For her visual addition into the game, I will definitely give her 10 out of 10. 9 out of 10 for her overall. Her console scores with me quite impressively as a 9 out of 10 console her trait in the right areas it's useful I mean yes you have to be quite specific what you're going to be using it for so her trait gets a 7 out of 10 with me the more universally usable a trait and the more useful the trait the higher it scores it's useful but not um, universally usable This is definitely a ship I would recommend. If you have the opportunity to get your hands on this ship, yes, I would recommend her. If you are sort of the person that likes a high maneuverability, quick strike ship, yes, she's definitely a good ship for you. Do I recommend her over all the ships in the R&D promotion? No, I would still advise the... Discovery Connie over her. But that's to my own personal preference, really. The question really comes in line of... Does she suit you, and is she worth the cost? A low galaxy... Well, Enterprise in the back there. You're not a galaxy class. You're a U universal class? Universe class? Can't remember which it was. Ah... <sighs> She's a nice ship. I've got to give her that. She is a nice ship. And very much a great addition to the game. Well done, Star Trek Online. I approve. Like I said, guys, let me know what you think of her in the comments section below. And may I just say, massive thank you to watching all the way to the end of this video. It's been a long one. To my viewers, to my donators, and to my patrons, a massive thank you. To those who have donated and to my patrons, you guys are helping this channel grow towards its aim of being a completely viewer supported channel. Rather than this goddamn monetization ad revenue that YouTube seems to be playing with at the moment. <laughs> Hell, it's good to see this channel growing well. And it's good to see this ship added to Starship Online. Almost feels like a good month to me. <laughs> Thank you for watching, guys. And from the VSS El Nemoy, remember, live long and prosper, my friends. Engage. <laughs>